Here. Councilwoman Jackson. Here. Mayor Tecklenburg. Here. And if you would like to join us, uh, please uh, join Councilmember Mitchell in reciting an invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Take time to be holy. Speak art with thy God. Abide in him always and feed on his word. As we come here to do the job for the city of Charleston and to represent our various districts and our constituents, let us be mindful that we are here as servant and as servant only. And let's be mindful also that we are not doing things for personal gains. And like I always state, that if you're doing it for personal gains, then my things that say you need to go home, and that goes for me too. Lord, we are asking you to come into our midst and bless everyone who is here today, our mayor, council members, and everyone who else is in this chamber, historical chambers tonight. We ask you to let us all be able to work together in harmony and peace, because we are all brothers and sisters. It matters not how we look, we are brothers and sisters. These blessings ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Place of Jesus to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you all for being with us this evening and um, the risk of um, being overly repetitive, but um, I think it's always safe to announce that in the most unlikely event that uh, we would need to evacuate the building, uh, these are our two exit doors out of this main room and there's an exit door over here. In that unlikely event, please do not use the elevator, but use the two stairs going down and then the one stair going out the front. Um, but I'd just like to share that with folks. Now we have a little proclamation, just one this evening, uh, that I'd like to share with everyone. And so to start with, I'd like to ask any representatives with us tonight with the League of Women Voters to please come forward. This is their birthday. Please, Y'all please come forward on the um, podium. If Council Members Jackson and Del Shapo would like to join us, uh, I'd certainly uh, welcome you to join us. So we have a um, special proclamation honoring the League of Women Voters, and um, so I would like to proceed to, to read it, and then I'll call on uh, whoever would like to uh, make some remarks from the League. So, um, and, and some of this is interesting history. Uh, whereas the League of Women Voters was founded on Valentine's Day, February 14th of 1920, 100 years ago, during the convention of the National American Women Suffrage Association just six months before the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which gave women the right to vote. And whereas the League of Women Voters recognizes that despite ratification of the 19th Amendment back in 1920, that many women of color were not afforded the right of vote until later with the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Whereas the League began as a mighty political experiment designed to help 20 million women carry out their new responsibilities as voters and to encourage them to use their new power to participate in shaping public policy. Whereas the League has since expanded nationwide to include all 50 states, more than 700 local communities, Charleston being one of them, and for 100 years, the League has been a respective, nonpartisan, activist, grassroots organization dedicated to empowering voters and defending democracy, whereas the League of Women Voters of the Charleston area, this chapter was founded in 1947, continues the League's commitment to making democracy work for all, protecting and expanding voter and voter voting rights, uh, providing nonpartisan information about political candidates and public policy issues, and supporting and promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, including the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. And whereas I'm honored to congratulate 
the League of Women Voters of Charleston area on the 100th anniversary of the League of Women Voters and thank them for your dedication to our community. Now, therefore, I, John J. Tecklenburg, Mayor of the City of Charleston, do hereby proclaim the month of February 2020 as the League of Women Voters Centennial Month in the City of Charleston. Thank you, Mayor and members of the Council. Um, actually, the proclamation is so well written that I don't need to give you a history lesson tonight. Uh, really, if you think back a hundred years, uh, women who had marched for decades in all kinds of weather all over the country, in the, those gosh awful dresses, <laughs> and hard leather shoes, unforgiving and tight and, and miserable, without water bottles, without tennis shoes, and with very few public facilities, they were on the precipice of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Think about that, 20 million women becoming eligible voters to participate in our democracy. If you think about that, that's an incredibly historic moment, not simply in our country, but in the history of mankind. Uh, but then what do you do? They, I, I always had this vision, they looked at each other and said, oh no, now what do we do? <laughs> and the conclusion was we take this on as a challenge and several of them organized the League of Women Voters to register 20 million first time voters to help educate them about the issues and the candidates of the day, and then to help them actually do their first vote. What, a, what an inspiring thing to have been a part of. Our work continues. Uh, we still have uh, voters to register. We still have candidate forums and debates to help educate voters. We still have voters guides so that the Candidates can get their word out about what it is they stand for. The work continues. But with your support, um, we, really, we really know that we have a chance to continue to live up to the principles that we've all set aside. Nonpartisanship was one of the great decisions those early ladies made. It made them welcome in every community across the country. And we continue to hold that as our, our bedrock principle, and it holds us in good stead. A year ago, you voted unanimously to encourage the passage and ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. A lot of good things continue to happen, but that's one more thing we need to get accomplished. We thank you very sincerely for this honor, and we look to celebrate it. Thank you. Thank you for all your good work. Thank you. There we go. So um, we don't have any public hearings tonight, and we're going to move right along to approval of city council minutes from January 14th. We have a motion and a second. Any additions, deletions? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, the ayes have it. So we're going to move right on now to our citizens' participation period. And it looks like we had about um, 17. Uh, close to 20 folks sign up. So uh, we're going to ask when you come forward, please state your name and address, and we're going to ask you to keep your remarks to about 90 seconds because. Um, uh, when, when she calls time, please just finish whatever thought you're on. We'll give you time to finish your sentence and all like that. But, um, but uh, p please be respectful because we just allow a 30-minute period for public participation. So Madam Clerk, we'll call out about uh, three or four names at a time. If y'all would just kind of queue up and we'll take turns and we'll look forward to your remarks. Shahid Lockman and Bill McKenzie. 
That's Black History Month. The wrongful accusation, rush to judgment. Two or more African Americans speaking without their masters knowing they could be punished in a conspiracy. That's real. Look at these walls. That happened to black people. It's still happening now. Um, the public safety chairman uh, did not give notice of executive session of his board. He did not do that. So on the 27th, I got something from the Department of Transportation, U.S. Department of Education from the U.S. Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. A camera was put on the table by the internal affairs who was there. There was no notice, no notice of executive sessions. I walked in the room several times. It was a setup. That's what I believe. He, he's a former U.S. attorney. My work is criminal street gang statutes. Uh, many of y'all young people can't barely read. 4,000 they cannot even read. How are they going to assemble themselves, Freedom Assembly? Assemble themselves the way you want to assemble them in that fashion. Uh, criminal, criminal Gang Prevention Act. They can't read. So how are they going to how they going to kind of work for Volvo or Boeing with a Daimler? What are they going to work for? Huh? This is about race and about class. A lot of black folk like talking about the assembly of our young people. I won't talk about it because I was framed and set up by black folk and white people. And I love every minute of it. That's the thing about me. I enjoy this. Because being unpopular is being black. The whole history of black people is triumphant adversity. Not about being comfortable. If your people ain't comfortable, you shouldn't be comfortable. That's the problem. And you can be sophisticated and be uncomfortable too. You can be Dudley, Greg, and keep wearing and Robert Mitchell and be uncomfortable. They are in your midst, but don't, don't hurt them. We don't see their own Time. young people on 60 Minutes for being criminals and they're not criminals. I don't like that at all. Time. Thank you, sir. Grace. Evening. May God all bless. May God bless all of us. I was a very famous man in this administration before John. But I made a statement. I put an article in the paper. And I became the enemy of the city that I love. And I like to read that what I put in the Chronicle newspaper in 206. Black people keep waiting on the government to do something for them. You can't expect Pharaoh to help the slave. He began, the ills that affect the black community only will be addressed through self-empowerment. The local black leadership and the black aristocracy, if he said, our leaders sit back being quiet while Mayor Joe O'Reilly worked the rich for the rich, pardon me, and not the poor. It's not even a black and white thing. It's a money thing. Wealthy black and our community exploit us just like white folks exploit us. Criminal white folk, not good white folk. Idris said several nonprofit organizations have been established in the black community by blacks to benefit blacks, which are funded publicly. Where is that money going? He asked, I said, I sit in city council meeting and listen to our councilmen beg for those Time. organizations. But the only ones I see benefiting are the people running the organization. They throw a bone to the community every now and then. Time. They keep the meat for themselves. They are nothing but crooks and hustlers. The black community hustle itself, E.G. said. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lockman Rashid. Is he not here? Okay. Um, so then we had Bill McKenzie, followed by Myra Polson, and then Ann Aub. Bill McKenzie, uh, 10 Coburg Road. I'm the Vice President of Development for DI Development Company, and we develop or manage the development for two large master plan communities in the city. I'm also a member of the Stormwater Task Force. And while there are a number of good ideas in the new Stormwater Manual, it really hasn't been tested to see what the cumulative impacts are. And we really encourage you to make sure all of these impacts are looked at, not just one good idea or two good ideas, but that overall impact is going to change dramatically the way neighborhoods look. And further, with the rise of the outfall elevations to six and a half, there are a number of grand trees that will drown. It's not about fill, 
they'll drown. There's no way to get the water away from them, and that's going to be a big change. We've been able to preserve a number of trees, the smaller, at the lower elevations, but we'll no longer have a way to do that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right, see Amira Paulson here. Yes. Hello, everybody. Hello. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Myra Paulson. I lived in Darlington County for 73 years. Okay. I packed myself up and I moved myself to my dream. And through the city housing authority, I was able to even live my dream to live downtown Charleston. Now, there are some of you, and I can never pronounce your name. <laughs> yeah, she's our council lady, uh, representative. Uh, I sent some letters out concerning the parking in the area at 22 Lauren Street off of um, Washington Street. I live in William Terrace apartment complex. It is wonderful. The neighborhood is wonderful. We've got so much building going on in there. But the parking, there's a lot of parking, but it's all got parking meters. And we only got very slim, we only got 12 places in our parking thing, and I'm the ninth on the list to be in the parking garage. So uh, I have reached out to a number of people, and they have responded back to me, and Mr. Seekins is trying to get a, a meeting with Mr. Benjamin and Mr. Somerville. And, but I like to put a face with everything. I like for people to see me. And I just want all of y'all to know, if you do not love Charleston, don't tell me about it. <laughs> well, welcome to Charleston. Oh, thank you. Right. Okay. Got a face with that message. Yes. And Auburn. Okay, please come, as your names are called. Susan Lyons. Mark Bloom. Good evening. My name's Ann Auburn. My husband and I have lived at 12 and a half Gadsden Street for the last 21 years. Um, as those of you who know the city know that Harleston Village experiences a lot of flooding. We've had flooding both in the street and in our house over the last several years, um, which has been most distressing. I'm here to speak on behalf uh, or in favor of the new revised stormwater manual. Um, I understand. I have not read every word. I would challenge anybody in this room to ask if they have read every word. It's very long and complicated, um, which tells me that a very uh, a large number of very smart people worked on it. Um, obviously, um, it's something new uh, to the city, uh, but I feel very strongly that anything that we, the city can do to mitigate flooding, to help in uh, stemming the Tide, sorry, bad pun, um, of um, what we're experiencing in this city and what we'll, we will continue to experience. I uh, urge you to accept it. I understand it's up for a second reading this evening. Thank you very much. Next oh, next meeting. Next Thank you. Meeting. Thank you. For coming out. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susan Lyons. Um, I'm not going to touch this tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I am so. Thank you, Mayor Tecklenburg. I'm so grateful that we have an extraordinary stormwater department now. They are working on all cylinders to make sure that we preserve the city we love, that we build it in a way that makes sense in light of sea rise, and that we pay attention to the impact that water increasingly has on our neighborhoods. We need the new carefully designed stormwater manual as a development guide to help avoid the unnecessary mistakes and miscalculations such as have occurred in the past. And we need to trust our stormwater and resilience profess uh, professionals like Matt Fountain and Mark Wilbert. I urge the members of, con of council to resist the inclination to revert to past practices. Flooding, which is what our future surely holds, compels a better approach. Please, on second reading, which I realize is not tonight's coming up, on second and third readings, please move ahead, approve the stormwater manual for everybody's sake. Thank you. Hi. 
Um, my name is Mark Bloom. I live at 7 Gadsden Street and I represent uh, Groundswell. Um, I uh, actually, I said a couple of weeks ago here that I had read part of the uh, new stormwater manual and really had not understood it. Um, it is uh, uh, extremely detailed and I'm sure it is full of nuance that is beyond my capacity. Nevertheless, um, uh, it's the nuance that I refer to. In the two weeks since I was here, um, I've heard rumblings that there may be efforts to, um, if you will, water down some of the uh, uh, stronger provisions of the uh, manual in, in the second and perhaps third reading. Um, I urge the council members to consider any efforts to water down this document um, very carefully. Now, I'm, I'm a lifelong journalist, retired now, so I normally uh, don't um, uh, accept documents from the government without um, <laughs> without um, a certain amount of skepticism. But this one, from what I'm told, Time. once again, I'm a layman, appears to be a first-rate effort. And I hope you people will consider it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Next will be Lori Kramer, Rob Kramer, Veronica Goodridge, Edward Good... No, Good... No, she wants to talk with her husband. Oh. Um, um, okay, where were we? So, is it Good, Hardy, or Edward? Good, Edward? Is it Edward Good? <laughs> Whichever you prefer. <laughs> well, we're coming out in mass. I'm Lori Kramer. I'm at 11 Gadsden Street. Um, you have seen my home in the paper quite a few times. I'm on the severe and repetitive loss property. Um, we've taken up to 32 inches of water in our... In, on our property. So, um, yes, I'm here to say again, there's a whole lot of us out here that are living this flood mess, this flood horror, and this flood reality. Um, the stormwater manual is exciting for us just as a step in the right direction. We're seeing progress on flooding. Uh, I have to say the recent efforts in it have been obvious and uh, I can only hope for more. But what I did hear when I first voted for you was that infrastructure was going to matter to this administration. And infrastructure is what we're talking about here. And it's the point of this infrastructure that's going to save the city. We can't have tourism with excessive flooding. We can't maintain our property values with excessive flooding. It matters to us, the people who live here, who breathe, who pay taxes, who do what this city needs. So thanks for your consideration of the stormwater manual. Bob? I am. Okay. Well, I'm Lori's husband, and uh, <laughs> that's a hard act to follow. Um, I haven't read the storm um, document myself, but I can tell you that we do flood continuously. It's an ongoing problem throughout the city, and any efforts to curtail uh, a solution to that problem is not feasible. And I don't want to take up too much time. Some people have gone over time. We do need to think about the future, and the future is not the past. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Veronica Goodrich with Groundswell. And I've been coming here for almost four years now, I think. And we've come a long way. Hooray for the stormwater manual and all the work that each one of you, and Matt, Matt wherever you are, and Mark Wilbert, wherever you are, and you've all put a lot of time into this, so embrace it. Embrace it because it's our future. It's a modern, hopefully a plan in place that will hopefully curtail the problems that we developed in the past. But I also want to point out that a lot of stormwater and flooding has been mitigated with the ongoing efforts of 
a check valves that were very important, which is something that was not even a conversation four years ago, let alone elevating of homes. That was a bad word, four years ago only. And now we have five people waiting for grants from FEMA to elevate their homes. I think this is a conversation that I've waited for for four years. And I'm thrilled that we're moving forward. And I'll still be here to make sure we will move forward. Um, that embrace the stormwater manual. I know it's extensive. Um, and let's not fall back on the bad practices that have been exampled in the past. Okay, Edward Good or Good Edward? Which one? <laughs> okay. All right, so we're done with him. He's coming forward. Yes? We, we have to come to the mic. When you come forward, start with the side of the just come in and observe. Sir? Sir? Talk down the hallway, that's a good idea. Just come forward. Okay. Well, my name's Edward Good. Uh, I grew up in Charleston. My dad's office was right below this. Edward Good was a city engineer, but I've been in Houston <laughs> for 50 years. My next door neighbor is here and told me there was a meeting today about diverting traffic on uh, Golf View Drive from Maybank, which would put it right in front of my house. And on the 10th fairway, I don't know how anybody could do that because these guys are teeing off. I have taken a couple of pictures. I've got about 100 golf balls, if anybody would like to have it, <laughs> that I've collected in the one year that I've been here. But every house along there is collected. There's no way, I think, that we could divert traffic onto that street. It's not wide enough to accommodate a truck and a car at the same time. And people driving down there would be meeting the terrible slicers <laughs> who bounce golf balls off my house and the traffic would be coming right at that tee. They would have to build a series of nets or wires along the... Matter of fact, my daughter was here from California about four weeks ago and we were taking a walk and she got hit in the throat by a golf ball coming off the 10th tee and it took her to the ground. Had it been about three inches higher, it would have put her eye out. But they're just... There's too much activity along there to put a divert traffic. I don't think the traffic could come like because people are playing golf there. All right. Thank you, Mr. Good. Is it possible to add another name to the list? Too late. A will allow. Yeah, we've had a sign in for years now for uh, years. over a year. Uh, maybe multiple years. But let us work on through the list. We'll check the time and uh, let's keep it. Yeah. Okay, so we'll have Frank Hardy, Suzanne Hardy, Cash and Drolet, and Cypress Buffum. Is it, oh, I'm sorry, Cyrus okay. Buffum. I need the mayor. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Hi, Suzanne Hardy, uh, 32 Prelude Street. I'm a member of the Charleston Area Justice Ministry. For those who you, uh, of you who are new, uh, CAJUM is a local nonprofit organization composed of 33 orga organizations and congregations. Uh, we envision a future of a thriving community liberated from unjust systems. Last year, CAJUM called for a regional housing trust fund to address one of those unjust systems, the lack of affordable housing. From extensive research, we identified the need for $30 million a year um, to be split among Charleston, North Charleston, Mount Pleasant, and the county. At the 2019 Nehemiah Action, we gained commitments from four Charleston County, Charleston Council persons to champion the trust fund with council. Thank you. Uh, we also got the same commitments from members of the three other councils. Recently, the Bloomberg Harvard report also recommended a regional housing trust fund and they recommended CAJUM as a key strength and the community organization to work with to further that initiative. We met with the mayor last week and heard his own commitment to the report and the trust fund itself. The mayor also committed to partner with CAJUM to get there. These are all positive steps. We want to commend Charleston on their proven commitment to affordable housing as witnessed by the significant work to date and also the commitment to the regional fund. And we recognize, as do you, the tough road ahead. 
It's going to take strong and visible leadership by Charleston to bring this regional imperative alive. Not just in providing our own funding, but in bringing Time. in the other m municipalities. We ask you to take up that mantle and lead the area to make affordable Time. housing available. <clears throat> Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma Frank Hardy, also 32 Prelo. Back up. Oops, I better let you do that. Amazingly enough. Uh, also a uh, Cajun member. Uh, we would do the affordable housing for our workers and our diverse populations that the community needs to remain one of the country's best communities. For Cajun's part, we have worked and are currently working with North Charleston and the county to buy, get their buy-in to the regional trust fund as well. We are committed, we are persistent as you know, and we will partner with you to do whatever is needed. We invite you to our Nehemiah action on March the 30th at 7 p.m. We're gaining broader commitment to and funding for the Regional Housing Trust Fund will be a key focus. Visible leadership by Charleston will make a difference. Thank you so much. Cashin Drolet to Craven Avenue representing Historic Charleston Foundation. I'd like to commend the Public Works Committee for the arduous work they have done to the, on the construction noise ordinance under Chairman Waring's leadership. Committee members engaged in a very lengthy and thoughtful discussion on appropriate hours, days, special exceptions, implementation dates, permits. We at the Foundation are encouraged and hopeful that it will produce a robust ordinance that balances quiet enjoyment with construction activity and we look forward to working with you on full implementation of an ordinance. I'd also like to comment on the Stormwater Design Standards Manual. HCF remains committed to the Dutch Dialogues. Uh, the updated manual puts important Dutch Dialogue rec recommendations into practice and is a critical component of the city's game plan to address flooding and climate change. We commend Council for taking the important step to engage citizens with educational workshops across the city. And we look forward to working with the city on additional measures to prevent fill from being used as a means to meet flood standards, curb flooding, and improve resiliency. Lastly, I'd like to comment on a recent meeting of the BZA where they heard and debated three proposed hotel projects under the new Accommodations Overlay Ordinance. We were very frustrated by the lack of understanding of the new ordinance by board members. At the very least, a workshop to educate board members on the ordinance is required. But we believe it would be wise for Council to go one step further and provide additional clarification on the ordinance on the definition of district, diversity of uses, and an ability to develop full service hotels. And we are committed to working with Council on successful implementation of the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cyrus. Okay, Cyrus. Good evening. Uh, my name is Cyrus Buffum. I reside uh, at 8 Weston Avenue in Hampton Park Terrace. And um, as the opening prayer was centered around service, I too would like to ensure that my comments are seen through that lens of service. Uh, I'm here to vocalize and to submit to the record my opposition to the proposed filling and destruction of Gadsden Creek and the implications of that action on the Gadsden Green community. Um, as uh, this is the largest fill project mandated by the city, I'd like to educate all of those here on council. First of which I'd like to uh, commend Councilman Sacrin, uh, Councilman Seekins, Councilman uh, Woman Jackson, all of whom I've had private conversations with and who have lent their, uh, their support of opposition to this proposed activity. Now for those unaware, um, on the west side of town, uh, there are four acres that are proposed to be filled and destroyed uh, in order to add four additional acres of upland entitled property for the West Edge project. Of that 3.936 acres, and this is from a survey submitted to DHEC and the Army Corps dated April 2nd, 2019, the city of Charleston it holds title to 64% of that critical zone. That means we, the citizens, own 64% of the creek, the wetlands, all of that critical zone proposed to be filled. Now certainly, if an application before DHEC is acting on behalf of property owners, i.e. us, Time. the residents, the city had to have lent its support. What was submitted with the application was a 2015 letter, um, arguably from Riley's administration, that Time. says, quote, the city of Charleston expressly authorizes the activities described in the permit application submitted to SCDHEC. 
I urge you on council to educate yourselves on the nuances and the technical mechanics of this issue and to urge the call of service. Thank this you, is sir. not an issue that should be unilaterally decided by private interests. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, so now we have know the, pe the people who said that they'd like to speak. Okay. How many did not know or would like to have the opportunity to speak? One, two, three, four, five. Could y'all come forward and ask you to leave it uh, to one minute, one minute each? Yeah. Okay, I called his name and he wasn't here. Is that Luke Mullen Rashid right there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. William Hamilton. Yes, sir. Uh, I, know, I noticed that tonight the low-line presentation is going to be brought before council. I would like to remind everyone in this Thank room you. that after years of struggle, we are on the verge of creating a real rapid transit system for the low country. Nowhere needs that more than the city of Charleston. It's workers, the people that live here. As the historic city slips away from the rest of the region, it has to be reconnected. This cannot be done effectively by a system operating in regular traffic on Meeting Street, a system where there's nowhere for stations, nowhere to connect with other bus routes, a street that's already very co congested. It's critical that the rapid transit system go down the old railroad line. That can be done in a way where it can still be a wonderful linear park. This is done all over the world. It went to before the Recreation Committee today. Their job isn't making sure that 100,000 people can get in and out of the city. I would strongly recommend that this matter be referred to your Transportation Committee for review because if we mess up this rapid transit system, no one's going to give us $350 million to try again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mayor Tecklenburg. My name is David Engel. I live at 309 Stone Oak Drive. I'm a lifelong resident of Charleston, and I'm here about the diversion of traffic off of Maybank Highway onto Golf View Drive. That is a huge mistake. I know it's you're going to be making a recommendation, I think, tonight. I hope you'll think about the citizens that live on Golf View. Um, the children, the pets, the people, the bike riders that use that little street. It's a very narrow street. It is a bad idea to divert all of that traffic for people who want to take a left on Riblin off of Maybank. I know it's a DOT situation. I know it's a county council issue, excuse me. Um, but we cannot pass the buck here. We need a recommendation from city council that that is not going to happen. We need a green turn light on that light. We can do it. The citizens will help you petition, talk to our state senators, whatever we got to do. But with the construction that's going on the golf course, thankfully, through the city, um, and, and the adverse effect on that community, I cannot tell you. I've lived over there for seven years. I'm going to spend the rest of my life over there. That would ruin that neighborhood. Please finish up. Thank, thank you. you. That's it. That's yes, it. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Hey. Hey, could I ask everyone, no uh, outbursts in the chamber, if somebody wants to uh, ask for a show of hands in support of a position, that would be fine, but we ask y'all not to have an outburst in the Mayor, chamber. Mayor, thank you. can I just very, very briefly, because I know these are all add-ons to our original sign-up, and I think many of them are about to talk about the same thing that Mr. Engel yeah. talked about, and I just got forwarded a copy of a letter that came from Senator Sen um, that we've seen that she has asked us, and we'll give the report out, but just so you know, there's a lot of other people now involved in this, and I've, if you've not seen the letter from Senator Sen, she's asked us to think more about it. Um, so we'll be talking about it in committee, but it's out there, so um, it just came through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Please Hi. state your name and address. I'm Pam Bingham from Golf View Drive. We have a front seat um, picture of what is about to happen in our neighborhood. And um, my husband and I are both lifelong members of Rivlin Terrace. Both grew up, went to Rivlin Terrace School together since first grade. We have a history there. We bought our home, raised our children, and now our grandchildren there. And we are just asking for y'all to, to not vote to approve this. This would be a detriment to our neighborhood, our, our friends, our neighbors, the children, the pets, and all who love Rivlin Terrace. We're not trying to pass the buck and say that the other problem is not a problem. We're just saying that you're making a problem in our neighborhood when you should be fixing a problem. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. My name is Gail Fralin. I live at 2146 Golf View Drive. I've been there almost 20 years. I, too, urge you to not pass through our neighborhood with heavy traffic. It is a narrow road. It can't handle two cars passing at once. And when it has been diverted on Maybank, 
it's impossible to even take a left out of my driveway and get off of my road. Not only that, but because those of us who've lived there bought these homes because of the beauty and serenity of the golf course. And also, Golf View is where all of Riverland Terrace goes to enjoy and walk their babies and jog and walk their dogs to enjoy the beautiful municipal golf course. Please, I beg you, save our beautiful street. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Price Crutcher. I live at 2164 Golf View. Apparently, the hornet's nest has been kicked. Mike Seekings, thank you so much for your support. Um, Word got around. It has gotten around very, very quickly, um, just here in opposition. Thank you, folks. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Jim Morissette. I live at 2184 Wapu Drive, a couple street over from Golf View. And I'm here just to echo the same sentiments. But I will also say uh, the process seems to be, could be tweaked a little bit. People woke up this morning to find this out. I mean, and we have a, a large constituency here also. So it just shows how adamant people are about not having input. They're not asking anything more than to have input on what happens to the street in front of them. So I will ask you to please either table this or not recommend the use of golf view for what the proposal was in the paper. Thank you, sir. Sure. Um, my name is Madeline Britton. I live at 2160 Golf View Drive. Um, I have not had time to prepare anything because, like he said, we kind of woke up to this information. I had a baby five weeks ago, and when we bought that house, I envisioned my son growing up and riding bikes with his friends and collecting golf balls and selling them for a quarter apiece. <laughs> you know, and uh, so I spent the morning, fl morning flying with another mom between feedings and diaper changes and naps, trying to get the word out so that everybody knew that this was happening. Um, I don't feel like this is a holistic problem to the or solution to this problem. People run that red light all the time. I wait three to five seconds before I even think about pulling out, and it also doesn't address people turning left from Johns Island onto Riverland. You know. We know that that intersection has been a problem. My neighbors and I, we have been often first people on the scene for those fatal accidents. We have witnessed it. I have witnessed one myself. Time. So I just would really appreciate an alternative solution. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Good well, afternoon, Mr. Good Mayor, morning. Council, newly uh, elected Council Member again, Mayor, to your election. Uh, my name is uh, Luke Mary Sheed, 48 Oswego Street. Um, I'm a longtime resident of uh, North Central neighborhood, and uh, as a representative of the oldest masjid in the Charleston area, uh, my community is indigenous community, Islamic community, masjid of Jamir Rashid on the Heights, Union Heights. Uh, we started here in Charleston in six, 1967. And Mr. Mayor, you know, and Mr. Mayor, uh, myself and I would like for you to meet, or have one of your representatives meet with me and, and a couple of others so that we can get, uh, be balanced with the Islamic community because no immigrant or descendant of an immigrant has what we have here in Charleston. I'm a student of Arabic. I have one fine, three actually, fine students in Arabic and one teaches at the Citadel, Time. Muhammad Frazier Rahim. Thank you very much. I uh, look forward to seeing you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. My name is Arthur Lawrence. I live at 214 Fishburn Street, West Side Neighborhood Association. Support the West Edge development. You have people coming here talking about closing gas and creek, but when they want to spend the money on low battery, nowhere to be found. When it's storm and those people that live in that area flat out, Nowhere to be found. The West, the, the West Side Neighborhood Association voted to support the development of Gasson Creek, and uh, we support it fully. Because I always ask people, if you have a problem with something, what is your solution? The city don't have the money to 
render this problem, fix this problem. If those people who want to preserve the creek Time. come with the money so those people won't have any problem being flat out their home every year. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think that, yes, sir, Councilmember Gregory. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I would be remiss if I don't sort of chime in on the Gatson Creek story because Gatson Creek is in, in my district. Um, as recent as yesterday, I had a meeting with um, Representative Gilliard, um, as well as the executive director of the West Edge. And our discussion was Gadsden Creek. Um, and I have also reached out to the leadership of Saving Gadsden Creek. Uh, so I'm in communication with them as well. <clears throat> Um, I do think at some point, uh, Mayor and Council, uh, that this body may need to go into executive session and have a discussion um, with the leadership of West Edge with regard to Gatson Creek. But I just wanted to make sure that folks are aware that we are aware of the issues. And, and the young man that just spoke um, I'd like to get his name so I can include him in any discussions that I might have with Tamika, because I've already reached out to her as well. Right. So I appreciate your comment. Cyrus, Cyrus, Cyrus. If, if you would get yes. your information to Councilmember Gregory, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. Uh, so that's the end of our citizens' participation period. Thank you all for coming and sharing with us, and uh, I think we are listening. So, um, petitions and communications. We have two reappointments to the Housing Authority of the City of Charleston, uh, Ms. Wigfall and Mr. Partlow. Um, do I hear a... Yes, we have We a have a motion and yes, a second. Any do. discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, the ayes have it. Um, next, I, I was asking council to consider a resolution to communicate with our House and Senate delegation to oppose H4431 as it currently stands. And if I may, uh, we have a motion and a second. Council Member Griffin and then Del Chapo. Mr. Mayor, I'm fully in support of this, but I'm just wondering why this didn't go to the Business License Committee. Uh, I thought we were doing a better job of sending things to committee, and for some reason, this one didn't make it. Well, um, I think the next Business License Committee is going to take up this matter it's before the house right now so um we we felt some urgency i was at a meeting last week uh, of the municipal association and uh given that they're considering it presently we just wanted to go ahead and get word to them but th there are some um, um some some matters that the business license committee does need to take up in regard for this if i may uh, just one more minute uh, Council Member Del Chapo, um, when when we were in Columbia last week, um, the the key provision that's um, um, harmful to the city of 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 H4431 is regarding the funding. We all agree at the Municipal Association um, that some standardization of timing and uh, application forms and information amongst all the cities in the state is a positive thing and I think there will be continue to be an effort to uh, amend uh, 4431 in that regard but if they change the funding uh, calculation from a gross which we use gross, gross proceeds to a business as opposed to net it will literally cut our knees off uh, below our themselves uh, and from a funding point of view uh, to the tune of millions and millions of dollars to the city of Charleston that we would not otherwise be able to make up and so that's a critical part that we oppose councilmember Del Chapa um, so I actually called my state house representative Nancy Mace over the weekend when I saw this and today when she was up in Columbia she grabbed the LIC chair for a minute to express you know my questions regarding this and the intent and i'm just reading her text messages so excuse me that i'm looking down but the intent is that it will not take any money away from the city 
um, the city actually sets the tax, the, sit, the state does not. It's really more, as you mentioned, Mayor, to standardize the classifications and subclassifications to simplify the city's jobs. And also to make it easier for a business owner, rather than running all over the place to multiple municipalities, to just be able to go to one central portal and be able to pay their taxes that way. So I just wanted to clarify, because I, as I read this, it seemed as though it was you know, taking away this major revenue source for us. And so I just wanted to cl clarify that, as Nancy said specifically, this bill will not take a dime away from the city. The city can set the tax. The state does not set the tax. It simplifies the city's job. Right. Well, th there are those standardizations. Uh, uh, there's a lot of scrutiny about what the bill says. And um, it does, in fact, impact our, our funding as written. Now, there's already uh, House and Senate members right. who, who are proposing to amend that portion of the bill, and so maybe she's referring to um, an amendment, right. but as it's originally written, it would change the calculation from using gross proceeds that a business receives to net. And so easily a partnership could just um, pay the partners a little more money and claim that they have no net income and hence owe no business uh, license fee. And when you're operating in the city, um, uh, whether you're making a buck or not, we still have to provide police service, fire protection, environmental services. So to, to allow businesses to potentially manipulate what they would pay in, in a business license fee would be very detrimental to us. And that is the way it was originally written. So I, I appreciate that Representative Mace may support um, our position that it should remain as a gross calculation and not a net. If that's the case, uh, I'm very happy to hear that. Because I, I know when I talked to her over the weekend, I said, you know, where, how can we make sure that funding is secure so that we're not losing money as a city when this is a major revenue source for us? Right. So, Council Member Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I, um, I, I did pay attention to this as it came through the Municipal Association. Um, uh, this at their annual meeting this summer and then I went to the regional um, session that several of us attended in the early fall and this is a big deal um, it not not only on its face for the reasons that you have recited mayor about the, the change in our in our revenue scope but also in the change of, of the state actually then controlling the license um, application process and the you know the data that's collected from the businesses the whole goal on paper is to make it uniform and the municipal association has been working their brains out to develop a way to um, over overarch the municipalities that would use the same application system they've developed um, software that we can all take advantage of we're in a different spot in it originally because the city had taken upon ourselves to make our licensing process you know, m much more state-of-the-art uh, friendly for our purposes to catalog and, and require people. But I think if, if the Municipal Association has the ability of making it a uniform, one-size-fits-all application process across all the municipalities in especially in our region where business owners do you know, business across many jurisdictions, that it would behoove us to cooperate with that. But basically, that, it's, a, it's, a, it's a grab by the state to take over a functions that local government should provide to, for its citizens and to the business owners that we, that we do, do business with and our citizens are benefited by. And, and I, I'm just opposed to this as something that we've seen a pattern of the state not trusting local government to do the work of the people. So I, 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 I will strongly support this resolution. Right. Council Member Appel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I am very much in favor of this resolution. I think this is a massive overreach by the state of South Carolina. It's an assault on home rule. And I'll just point out for our fellow, uh, you know, everybody in the room, business license revenue is our number two revenue source for this entire city after property taxes, okay? So um, 
roughly speaking, our property taxes go to fund law enforcement. Everything else essentially runs through business license taxes. So what we're talking about here you know, speaks directly to what we do and what we're trying to do on an everyday basis. So when we're talking about what we're going to be doing about transportation, about flooding, about all these different things that we're trying to address in the coming years, it's all the more important that we have the power to solve Charleston's problems here in the state of South Carolina. Stay out of the way. So, and, and these issues that Councilmember Jackson mentioned, uh, Councilmember Griffin, are those very issues that, that I would like for our business license committee to take up uh, as far as uh, the recommendations for standardization and forms and all like that. And maybe the wording of this um, is, a, is a little, um, um, you know, where it says the, if the business license tax is eliminated is, is not exactly correct because they're not, they're not, um, H4431 doesn't in fact uh, propose to eliminate the tax, but it changes, um, it, it, it proposed to change the way the the uh, license fee is calculated. So um, maybe it would be more appropriate for us to say, whereas if the business license um, um, tax funding is, is altered in any way or diminished in any way, or, um, you know, is, I agree with that. is taken out of our control, because th <laughs> this is a little bit of a misnomer, I, I, I agree reading it. They are proposing to eliminate it, but we don't want them to change the the, 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 way it's calculated. the way it's calculated and the way that we have authority over it uh, rather than that authority going to the state of South Carolina. Th thank you, Mr. Mayor, and that's why I do think we need to send it back to the committee because we also want to make sure there's no provision put in there that will prevent us moving forward from administering our own business license fees as well. And I think that's something we need to look for. So um, I'm fine with that. If we go ahead and call a business license committee meeting, and um, not only deal with the wording of this, but also with the, um, um, the particulars of the standardization. Does that make sense, y'all? Okay, Council Member Jackson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, would we have the opportunity then to um, resolve to um, send whatever changes to a resolution that the, that the license committee would like to put forward yeah. without it having to come back to Council? I'm, okay. I'm worried about the timing of that, though. So I, I do uh, think that it's something that could be, it could get to the floor quickly. Well, a few of our friends in the Senate have, have since the other day, last week, um, um, committed to me that they'll keep a lid on this um, so some further amendments can occur. So as long as the Business License Committee can get together before our next meeting, I think we'll be okay. I do. Council Member Gregory? Okay. So we're going to defer it. So, so we, okay, uh, by acclamation, just deferring this to the, uh, re referring it to the Business License Committee. Good. Okay, thank you. So next up is, um, um, yeah, we've, okay. I think it was Council Member Griffin's suggestion to start with. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So um, no, we have our uh, council communications. We didn't have uh, any uh, additions to the agenda there, although I see a hand go up. Council Member Jackson. Thank you. Um, Mayor, I, I, I think I gave you advance notice. I, I, we had a council communication um, discussion based on our um, uh, small cell 5G ordinance, um, actually before my new colleagues were seated in January. And I know that um, at that point we sent, uh, we asked Ms. Herdina to be researching uh, suggested changes that our citizens were asking of us in addition to some of the things that she wanted to, to uh, recommend to us to amend our existing 5G ordinance. And I know she's been hard at work on that. In the meantime, there has been a, a, another preemptive type bill at the state legislature that is being rapidly moved through to, again, restrict the local government's opportunity to regulate anything about 5G installations. So um, I'd, like, I'd like you to call on Ms. Herdina so we can just get her update, and I think she has a recommendation for us to, to take forward at the next meeting. So can we just do that as a continuing item under okay. communications? 
Well, um, let me let me say this. I, w I was going to ask for two um, uh, committee reports that aren't official um, council committees, but city committees. One is health and wellness, at which this matter was discussed, and Ms. Hardinia was there. I was going to ask Mr. Seekings, who chaired the meeting just the other day, to give us a brief report. And if part of that, uh, Ms. Hardina wants to chime in, I, I think that'd be appropriate. Um, um, if, if that's um, no objection from council. Council Member Seekings, could you give us a little report on the Health and Wellness uh, Committee meeting? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, fellow council members, the Health and Wellness Committee did meet on Wednesday, February 5th, 2020. For those of you who may recall, this is a committee that we put together now a couple, three years ago at the mayor's suggestion. It is a very well attended committee. It's made up of a number of people in the community who literally just flat out show up and are really interested in what's going on. It is chaired by um, Anton Gunn. He wasn't there, so I had the honor of chairing it the other day. Um, and just so you know, we, in an hour, take up many, many things. We talked about um, B -Smart, the Be -Smart, Smart Gun Safety Campaign that MUSC is putting on for child protection. We talked about um, all the updates from DHEC in terms of the coronavirus and the mumps. I mean, a lot of information came along. And at the recommendation of the mayor and this council, we also took up um, the 5G wireless radiation awareness and matters that we could address and that we could not address. And Mr. Dina was there, and I know she's here, so I just want to get her back up on this. But we, we did take advice from Mr. Dina before we began our conversation in the committee about the powers that the city have, has, or don't, doesn't have to address the installation and the operation of 5G cell towers within the bounds of the city of Charleston. And for those of you both on this council and in these chambers, if you haven't seen one of these towers, you ought to go take a look. Um, they're very large, they're intrusive, and if you believe everything you read, which I don't, but I think this is fairly accurate, they are going to be scattered very close, it's not even the right word, they're going to be populated in close, close proximity to each other. Uh, so they're going to be everywhere, and currently, um, and Mr. Dino would jump in as soon as I say something that's not right, but to boil down the about five or six minutes that she gave us, which is a comprehensive view on the law, we essentially in the city of Charleston do not have any power to regulate this, even though we're one of, we're the most important historic city and we have incredible number of regulations that we talk about all the time in this chambers over what happens on and in and around the properties in the city of Charleston. For some reason, this one just completely escapes us. We have nothing to say about it um, and those towers are going up quickly. So the Health and Wellness Advisory Committee sort of took the lead from Mr. Dina and unanimously was supportive of anything that this council can do to encourage home rule on this and to get out there and be able to have a conversation with our state legislators at the federal level. It really goes, comes back to the FCC. Um, they've sort of put the kibosh on us. Um, we don't have legal tools at our disposal, but we certainly have tools of persuasion and advocacy at our disposal. So what I will tell you is the committee is going to look to this council and to Ms. Herdina and her staff to put together a strong awarded and stated resolution, principally to look at, I mean, there's lots of things about these towers. If you go look at them, they're really horrible. Uh, but principally, we were interested in what the health implications are of what goes on those towers. And so with scientific research, with the good work of our legal counsel, what we've asked is to, for them and Ms. Sardina and her team to put together a resolution to both be considered by the committee and this council to move forward. Um, and um, am I missing anything? Thank you, Council Member. Um, that sums it up very well. There's really two issues that are ruminating right now. One is the health issue um, that the constituents have brought forward, and um, there the issue is to what extent, if any, uh, uh, radio frequency from the small cell towers right. are impacting health. And, and the answer there is that there's science on both sides of the issue. Um, some say there are potential health effects, others 
scientists say they're not, but as Council Member Seeking said, this issue is out of our hands. The federal government has totally pre uh, preempted the field of allowing local jurisdictions like the city to regulate the location of the small cell facilities on the basis of health. And so um, we had recommended at the committee that the city uh, pass a resolution and do whatever we can to encourage the federal, fed, our federal representatives to take a look at this issue again and look at it seriously and not just look at what's happening now, but look at potential health effects, which, which we encourage them to do. Um, we should also encourage our state representatives to do this, but frankly, they don't, they don't have much authority, if any, in this area either. It has been totally preempted by the federal government, and so we need to turn to our federal legislators and ask for help there. The other issue that's ruminating um, that Councilmember uh, Jackson uh, referred to a short while ago is it's House Bill 4262. And, and this is, um, it's called the Small SC Small Wireless Facilities Deployment Act. And um, it attempts to severely restrict our authority to control our rights of ways with respect to the installation and the design and the aesthetics um, of small cell wireless facilities. And um, what's interesting, as some of you probably know, is this bill was introduced in the House last March. It was passed out of the House in less than a month. And um, it is then re it was referred to the Senate in March of 2019. Um, it has since been referred to the Senate Judiciary Committee, and there are subcommittee hearings that are going on right now. Um, Myrtle Beach has taken a lead uh, with AT and T in trying to negotiate a bill, um, but again. Many municipalities and Massey are against it because it is really an assault on local authorities' ability to regulate our right of ways. You know what the facilities look like are being taken out of our hands. How much we can charge for the installation on um, public rights of ways taken out of our hands, um, and so um, we, in that respect, are. And this, is, this bill is moving along fast in the Senate, and so uh, we are recommending that our state legislators here um, appreciate um, the uniqueness of the city and its historic issues and, and other areas, and that we slow down and take a look at this bill and not pass it that quickly. Um, we have an ordinance in effect, as some of you know who are here. We passed an ordinance a couple years ago. We worked hard with AT&T and the and Crown Castle and Verizon on this ordinance, and, and we think it's a good fit for Charleston, and we really don't see the need for this House bill to move forward and, and usurp that um, that ordinance. So in any event, those are the two things that, that are um, circulating right now on 5G small wireless facilities. And it was our recommendation that um, we come back, that, that legal comes back with some resolutions asking for some time to look further at the House bill and also to encourage our legislators to look more closely at the developing science on the health impacts of the um, RF coming from the small facilities. Thank you. Well, thank you for that update. Council Member Sackman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a point of clarification. I, I realize our hands are tied in many ways. Does that include um, schools? Is there anything we can do in terms of we, we have no authority at this point to, to prohibit the location of a small cell facility based upon health impacts. Our zoning abilities are being stripped away by this state bill, frankly. Councilmember Jackson. Yeah, we, 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 we are, do not need a report back. We just left it to Mr. Dina to come back to council with something that's comprehensive to be voted on. I, I mean, I, I agree. This is moving fast through the Senate. Um, I think our, my senator, Sen, uh, represents a lot of us. Um, 
is, is um, trying her best to slow it down. And I don't know if she has a lot of support from the Charleston County delegation. But again, this is one more example of how our, our local authority is being taken away from us. And it would undo the ordinance that we've had on our books for 18 months, correct? We, it's it's we not clear what impact it would have on existing existing um, ordinances, but I, I'm sure there will be an attempt to try to unravel that and replace the state law with what we've previously passed, but I don't think that's been decided yet. <clears throat> Council Member Shade. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So when we pass these resolutions, we, we send them off to our local delegation. I mean, do they get these resolutions and do we send it off with a cover letter from you? What, what happens with these resolutions after we pass? We pass a resolution to support the ERA being passed. Um, did that go off to our local delegate? So what, what follow-up do we have with, with this sort of stuff? I mean, we, we passed a resolution about the hate crime bill getting passed. Um, but unless we... I mean, I've done some follow-up with the hate crime bill and talking to some other folks about what we need to do to get it, get it moving. But it seems like unless we take an active role with this, and I know we've got lobbyists that we have, that we, that we uh, work with, that unless we take an active role on this, we pass a resolution and we go on to our, our next point of business. And um, we see the erosion. This is an ongoing process with the erosion of, 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 of local rule, home rule. So our local legislators, and I, know, I think many of us around this table have a good connection with our local legislators. If they're not aware of this, if they're not aware of what's going on, and, and if they're getting misinformation about what is taking place with some of these other uh, rules, then this is ineffective. And they can come back to us and say, well, why don't you tell me? Well, I didn't realize what was going on. I, I, I certainly believe that they're not reaching out to the mayors of, of our community, asking them for their input on, on this sort of stuff. I don't think that happens. I and mean, if it does, that, that would be a surprise that that was taking place. But I know we're burdened. I know we've got more work that we need to do uh, serving our constituents and serving what we do here in, in meetings and council. But unless we take an active role on some of these things that are precious to us, and this is precious to us, and this is, this is undercutting our funding issues, it's undercutting our zoning issues, it's undercutting health issues that we're, that, we're, that we're dealing with on a regular basis. Unless we take a more proactive role in doing something with this, that's nice that we pass a resolution. But we've got to do more. I mean, I, and I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but we've seen that we need to either collectively do something with contacting our local legislators, writing them letters, or even caravanning out there and, and working with North Charleston, Mount Pleasant, and other communities. So this impacts all of us. And I just don't think that um, our local legislators, I just texted one local legislator, I said, do you know about this bill? He goes, I have no idea about it. Well, I, I mean, I think that's just sort of telling of what is happening with this thing. So we've, we've got to take the next step forward on this. I'm just not sure how to do that and, and how we go about it, taking that next step. But we've got to do something else besides passing a resolution. Council, Council Member Waring. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to uh, say what Councilman Chilier just said. Uh, I think we do extend ourselves to our relationships. Uh, all of us have collective relationships with our delegation, and quite frankly, all the way to Congress and the Senate. Uh, to pass a resolution and just let it um, be on a sheet of paper without action, that's part of the action steps of doing that. So, so I, I think you're on the right path there, uh, Councilman, by reaching out and planning and extending our, our tentacles and maybe bringing up some of the other people's up to speed. Now, you got, we got to be prepared. They're going to bring us up to speed on something else, but that's okay. Right. You know, we, it should be a two-way deal, so I sign on to what you say. So oh, absolutely. I mean, we can pass a resolution. We can send it to them by email and in the mail, but there's nothing like that one-on-one -on -one conversation. You represent a certain number of constituents that are also constituents of uh, our House and Senate members and uh, directly communicating um, in their face, on the phone, however you can track them down, uh, it's the most effective. I mean, it's a busy time of year for them. Are they paying attention to each and every email they get? Uh, a personal contact and conversation is best. No, no question about it. Okay. So, um, so we'll come back um, next meeting with some resolutions uh, from the Business License Committee after they meet and uh, just from our legal staff on this matter of the small cells. Any further discussion?
That concludes the report. And no action is needed. Uh, we're just receiving that for information. So next, we'll move on to our uh, more formal council committee reports. First up is community development. Council Member Mitchell. I'm going to second for, move for approval for the committee report. All right. Any discussion? So um, I would like to share um, for the other council members who were not there and for the members of the public who were here that a, uh, it was mentioned by a few folks making remarks that at that meeting was a very comprehensive housing for a fair Charleston plan, a five-year plan uh, sustainable and inclusive for, for growth of affordable housing in our city. Um, talk about tools in the toolbox, there's everything in there from the pliers to the wrench to the screwdriver. I mean, there's an amazing number of, of, uh, of strategies and plans, many of which we're already engaged in, but some of which we have not. And um, it's very comprehensive, and I want to sh shout out and thank uh, Gianna Shaw Johnson, our housing community development department putting this together really over the last 18 months and um, uh, it's online I think we've shared it with council it's a uh, it's a really comprehensive plan for moving us forward for more affordable housing in Charleston and that was the, the bulk of the presentation and I just want to thank those who were involved in it. yeah any further discussion or? Well, Mayor, when we take the vote, we will um, be approving A, B, C, and E. Right. D is deferred. Correct. This uh, E was just a, a matter of a conversation, uh, instructing staff to proceed with uh, work on a proposed accessory dwelling ordinance. Uh, but, but Madam Clerk is correct by uh, voting to accept the, the, the report of the committee, we would be approving um, the, the uh, resolution and grant agreement with the CRC, which actually passed at um, Ways and Means earlier. Also additional uh, funding for the Humanities Foundation and a project they're working on to uh, rehab Archer School and then uh, a commitment to help re-ventures, but um, first before adding any additional funding, we discussed um, um, uh, seeing if we can get them a variance which would allow them to proceed at a lower cost. Any That's, further, Council Member Gregory? Yeah, Mayor, I, I would just like to piggyback on um, your comments with regard to the, um, the plan. Yes, sir. Housing for a fair Charleston. I did get a chance to really read through it. Sir? I did have an opportunity to finally read it. I mean, it is really a great yeah. document. Um, it's very comprehensive. Um, it's almost like a one-stop shop. Uh, anything you want to know on affordable housing. Uh, so I really want to commend um, everyone that worked on that document. Um, it's a, it's, it's a great job. Being an old housing person, that's a really good piece of work. Thank you. Um, and uh, the young lady that worked on it with us, I hope we can convince her somehow to stay because that's a really, really great piece of work that was done and I appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. Not Natasha Hicks is her name. And I will share with the rest of council and the public to give credit where credit is due. This is not any kind of uh, endorsement, um, but she was made uh, available uh, to the city of Charleston, her services and time uh, through a grant from the Bloomberg Philanthropies. And uh, they've been helping us in a number of ways. So thank you to Mayor Bloomberg for, for uh, his assistance on this. Uh, council Member Ware. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it was a great report. I, um, one of the things that came out of that, though, was a piece that I think our planning department is supposed to bring to us next at the next meeting on creating smaller lots. One of the issues, listen, you guys are missing out by not being on community development. Very, very good committee. <laughs> um, one of the things that brought up is, you know, we had this accessory dwelling unit uh, provision back in. What is that besides creating a smaller lot? Okay. 
Well, we had years ago, decades ago, centuries ago, um, Freedmen Cottages created. And they, those smaller lots are part of the success of the peninsula. Today, if you tried to create a Freedman lot, which many of them were 30, 35 feet, certainly less than 40 feet wide. As a matter of fact, my colleague right here owns a, a house that's on a lot that's 35 feet wide. I've looked it up, okay? Uh, but That big old house? Built, built a long time ago. Yeah. Built a long time ago. They had a vision a long time ago that we enjoy today. But some place in planning across the country said that the minimum lot size, and this happened as I understood back in the 70s, has to be at least 50 feet. Well, I don't know about across America. Charleston is a quintessential example that uh, you can do better than that and thrive. Well, as we revitalize uh, West Ashley, James Island, Johns Island, and certainly Kane Hoy, whatever, we need that in the toolbox. And our planning department has put a lot of work in creating a small lot uh, ordinance that has been on the back burner and deferred. And Mr. Lindsay, are we going to be able to hear from you in two weeks? That's us. Uh, that's... Hey. <laughs> Thank you. And I think one of the things that, the, uh, that we worked a lot on and couldn't make the numbers work, she succeeded here quietly, but the fine executive lady from the um, Humanities Foundation is putting together a transaction that's going to renovate, hopefully, Archer School into affordable housing. She hadn't said one word, but I'm going to tell you, Yeoman's work, the mayor got with uh, the deputy secretary of transportation that was going to go towards streets and sidewalks, potentially is now going to go towards helping to assist with affordable housing in perpetuity, hopefully in a long period of time. I mean, not perpetuity, but a long period of time. So Be working on a lot of hard work in that committee that's going to make a difference. And people came in citizen participation today and exemplified the city of Charleston for its lead in creating affordable housing in this region. And we do lead in that. And some of the techniques that we're doing can be duplicated by other municipalities. So uh, continue to lead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mayor. Yes, sir. Councilman. I think Mitchell. they do. Uh, some of the people need to do is come to our community development meeting to see what we are doing. There's a lot of things we are doing there. There's a lot of information that's being given out. In, dealing with housing and the community development. We're doing a lot there. I mean, it's a lot of things happen coming through community development. I just made the motion so we could go on, but you know, so I would have to go point by point. But anyway, you know. But any, it, any further discussion no, on any of these no. matters? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Who has not spoken yet? Okay, Council Member Sackman. I just wanted to say as a new member to, to, to council, the plan that we got presented last week or the week prior, they're all kind of blurring, was a perfect plan. It, it just helps paint a picture, an overview of, of what housing challenges we have in, in Charleston. So I just want to say thanks to, to the team, to Gianna, for, for getting that together, because it really helps me understand it. And to, to Councilman Gregory's point, it's, it's, it's an overview, and it's kind of a one-stop shop, and it, it really helped me from a technical standpoint understanding. Uh, our challenges. So, so thank you. Okay. So in case there was any question about accepting uh, the committee report, which includes uh, approving those items, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, the ayes have it. And um, and finally, as a comment, I, I, I mentioned the Humanities Foundation. I would like to recognize Tracy Doran, who is here with us this evening um, with the Humanities Foundation. And, and um, um, maybe bravery is a good word um, to take on the conversion, the renovation of Archer School to be an affordable housing, uh, um, a block of affordable housing in our city. I, th I think, um, well, it is brave uh, and it's uh, a very uh, thoughtful and, um, and we thank you for your efforts and we, we look forward to partnering with you and making that happen. So. All right, so next is our Committee on Public Safety, Council Member Shade. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council. The uh, Public Safety Committee met on February 6th to interview candidates for the municipal judge position, and we'll meet again on Thursday. Great. Next is our Committee on Traffic and Transportation, Council Member Seekings. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The Committee on Traffic and Transportation met yesterday promptly at 3 o'clock. And since that time, I've received 3,526 emails, and I'm sure my fellow colleagues have too. 
uh, and we'll get to that in a second. So as, a, as an appetizer for the main course of our meeting, we got a report from Charleston County on the CTC and TST projects and resurfacing. For those of you who don't know what CTC is, and it's no reason why you should, acronyms are no good, that's gas tax money. Um, the amount of money that actually finally makes it back to the county, by the way, on gas tax right now in the new formulation. It was a smaller number than I thought when I asked that question. It's only about $9 million. It's not a huge amount, but it's something, right? The TST projects are the half-cent sales tax projects, both on the original half-cent sales tax and the new half-cent sales tax. Um, as you probably know, the, the recently enacted half-cent sales tax is a pay-go as opposed to a fund that we have um, bonded against. So the projects are slowly but surely coming in the pipeline. There are a number of projects that are in or partially in the city of Charleston under both of those programs. And it was observed yesterday, I believe it was by the mayor, Taylor Green from the county who came and gave us the presentation, gave by far the most comprehensive, lucid, um, understandable presentation on what's going on in this county in terms of the expenditures of monies through these two programs and the CTAX money. Um, it was terrific. We, I got a copy of it this afternoon. I know Mr. Benjamin has it. I'm going to ask him to send it to each one of you. I would never normally do that to load up your inboxes, but it's a PowerPoint of about 20 slides that shows in very logical and chronological order the projects that are out there, and there are a number of them. Some of them are actually projects. Some of them are studies. That sort of the bigger, more comprehensive is on Johns Island, the um, main road corridor, um, Folly Road corridor. Um, they're looking and they're doing some projects. I've got a whole list here, but there are a number of them and a good amount of money being expended. So I would just recommend that you get a hold of this and see how your and our constituents' tax dollars are being expended. There's a, a good bit going on. One of the ones that caught my eye is the Northern Pitchfork, which is about to go to con about to go out for bid and to contract. So um, that's coming to a Johns Island near you. Um, there was no mention, by the way, of the Southern Pitchfork, which we'll need to follow up on. So. Um, that took up a good bit of our time. It was fascinating. I would totally just recommend you all get a hold of that presentation and see the projects and the studies that are out there because there's a lot of them. One of the things that did come up, by the way, and I don't want to take too much time, is as these new projects come or these widening projects, like for instance, Glenn McConnell, bike ped facilities and alternate facilities for getting around are being incorporated in all those projects, which is a very good thing, um, and monies are being expended for that. So that was the appetizer. Then we got to the main course. Um, we had a presentation and a series of recommendations on the intersection at Maybank and Riverland. Um, it's not the first time we've taken this up. Um, it was presented to us by our outside engineering um, advisors, Mr. Day. And um, I did not ask him to come and recreate that tonight. Um, had I known we were going to have as many people send emails, might have done that, but that's okay. There are a series of recommendations for that intersection, which is a effectively non-functioning intersection. Whether you come at it from the north, the south, the east, or the west, there are problems at that intersection. Probably the, the, the worst problems are coming from the east to the west trying to make a left turn off of Maybank Highway to get onto Riverland. That is problematic. There's been a number of incidents there. Those who came tonight to speak, they can, I'm sure, attest to all of those things. But coming off of Riverland, getting to Maybank Highway is slow. Coming out of Riverland Terrace onto Maybank, all of those things are problems. And our county and your state legislators are acutely aware of that. The issue is it's been left back to us to resolve it. Um, without all the tools probably necessary in our toolkit to do it because I think if you asked everybody yesterday around that table and I'll let them speak for themselves, we would have looked at that problem and said short term there's a super easy solution. Put a left turn light right there coming down Maybank Highway to get on a, on a, onto a Rivlin. I mean super easy solution. Well great but we have some people that look over our shoulders that don't think that's such a great idea. That would be the county and that would be the state. So anyway, we took a recommendation yesterday. There were five options that were presented to us. And we voted unanimously, by the way, on a hybrid recommendation, which was to put no left turn signs on Maybank Highway as you're coming west to the south and as you're coming east to the north, no left turn signs, um, which I live in an area where there's lots of no left turn signs. And I can tell you, uh, <laughs> well, anyway. So 
the combination of no left turn signs and then an alternate route to avoid the left turn off of Maybank to get under Riverland was discussed. And we voted in favor of the recommendation that we divert traffic off of Maybank Highway to loop back around, come onto Riverland and go across. And I know you all are shaking your heads because we got your 3,526 emails. So the good news is because um, we've now had 24 hours to digest our main course, um, and me as the chairman, I get to speak first, I'll let others. Um, I've heard your voices and I think after going back and looking at that, we can do better. Um, and we should do better. And I know that not all of you, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, live in the city. Some of you live in the county, but that's no excuse. We should be good stewards and good neighbors and make sure that we take care of everybody in that area. And it does seem to me, and this is now just me talking, not as a chairman, but as a member who's going to get a vote. Although I voted yesterday for this recommendation, I think we should really think this through, Mr. Mayor. Um, we did vote on it unanimously. And I'm going to ask someone to, at some point, make a, a motion to defer this. Since yesterday, we got your 4,000, 3,526 emails. Um, Senator Sen has weighed in within a, a two-page letter asking to take a deep breath and think about this. Um, I think we have a responsibility to meet with the DOT and our regional office to talk again about some other short-term options. By the way, a left turn signal is not a long-term fix. It's short term, probably better. There's probably some other things we can do. So although we voted unanimously yesterday um, to put this forward as a recommendation of a combination of no left turn signs on Maybank Highway and the diversion coming from downtown towards Johns Island around and through, uh, I for one think that we should probably rethink this and put this to a longer conversation, Mr. Mayor. And if there's any member of this committee who would move for a deferral, I would appreciate it. If not, uh, I'm going to vote against this resolution. So, so um, moved. Okay, got the. Have a second. So, so with that, and this is the only activity that we took up yesterday that needs a vote, um, Mr. Mayor. Can we call that question? And then I've got one more thing, really briefly, that we defer this. That we go back to the drawing board. We put all options on the table. We include everybody, including elected officials, and and we engage with the neighborhood. I mean, that is, I mean, I'd rather y'all, we sit around in a room and you have to come figure out the sign up and get up there and talk and all those things. I think we need to all those things. Um, I think we need to make sure your council member is there and I'm sure he's gonna make some comments about this. Um, but that is the one thing that needs a vote and I think I've gotten a second. So I'd ask that we move to defer this after right. we have any conversation. I think right. you take it from here, Mr. Mayor. Absolutely. And then I have one more thing to come back to on this report. Right. Any further discussion on this matter? Council Member Griffin, Appel, and Jackson. Oh, sorry. That'll be fine. Council Member Griffin, and I hear on. I hear the neighbor loud and clear on this. Um, I was taken by surprise by this as well. Um, I've learned more about traffic signaling over the last 12 hours than I think I have over the last you know, 35 years of my life. Um, I appreciate um, this, this walk back from what I believe was um, perhaps, perhaps a well-intentioned decision, but something that, of course, has unintended consequences. And I represent you know, the, the handful of homes that are in Riverland Terrace that are in the city, but this is obviously a, a very important issue that's impacted everybody. And if my inbox um, is any indication of how strongly um, it feels about it, um, I, I think it's a very good decision that we've made um, tonight. And, and I spent a lot of time on the phone today with Keith Benjamin, um, also with um, Senator Sen. She's on top of this. We're going to re-engage on this issue. We're going to do what we can to get DOT to come up with what sure seems to be a common sense solution. Again, here we are trying to do something very simple for a need that's very unique to the city of Charleston. And what do we have? We have bureaucrats in Columbia telling us what to do about a traffic signal on a road. I mean, it's unbelievable what we have to deal with and the challenges that we're under, whether it's business licenses, whether it's cell towers, whether it's a traffic light, whether it's, God forbid, a, uh, you know, a, a bike path somewhere. So we're, that's the system we're living in. We've got good representation in our, in our legislative delegation. We're going to engage with them. A lot of them are, are up for re-election again um, this, this fall. Um, Y'all vote for them just like you vote for us. Um, so we're going to make sure that these voices are heard loud and clear, and we're going to get the right thing done for the community. Councilmember Griffin. 
I appreciate uh, Councilmember Appel's polish. Unfortunately, I don't have that. I'm going to be a little more, bit more blunt. Um, number one, uh, he talks about common sense. I don't understand how anybody voted to approve this project the way that it is common sense wise. I'm sorry. I'm not on this committee. I can't speak for you. I hope that y'all all can share your sentiments on that. But to me, this was the worst of all the ideas. Um, number one, we're going to divert traffic off of Maybank. Now, let me take a step back for a second. This is an issue because it's dangerous. And we can all agree that changes have to be made because people's lives are at risk. Um, our staff may, might have kind of pushed this thing along because we have been working on this for a while and people are ready for action. Unfortunately, uh, we were put in a tough situation where certain people felt our hands were tied and, you know, some sort of agreement was made here that the city is going to take the responsibility and, and come up with this idea. Um, how did this happen? Well, we have a Department of Transportation that doesn't have any respect for us. None. Um, I hear it all the time from our, our representation in Columbia, specifically uh, Senator Sin, who talks all the time about this great relationship she has with the DOT, and I, I agree that she has that. Uh, but this is the time where she needs to be writing a letter, instead of asking us to defer this, she needs to be writing a letter to the DOT saying to get it done. Um, we need to, as a collective, march up to Columbia with our citizens and make them understand how angry we are about this. It's not just happening on James Island. It's happening all over our city. It's happening in West Ashley along Beast Ferry Road and Highway 61. We cannot get the DOT to work with us. Now I get it, they might help out on some downtown projects and God forbid we anger them a little bit, but I'm sorry. Unfortunately, I'm teed off about this, really. Um, I got a couple of other things to say. Um, we as a city cons constantly and consistently help the DOT. We take sidewalks over for them because they can't maintain them. We take on that responsibility and that price tag. Each person in here that's a resident of Charleston is paying to maintain sidewalks that were at one time DOT responsibility. And guess what? When we need something as simple as a left turn signal, they tell us, hey, too bad, so sad. We shouldn't take that um, as an answer. We should fight this. Our citizens came here tonight on less than 24 hour notice and begged us to fight. And that's what we should do. Our procedure on this stunk, unfortunately, just bad. We cannot expect our residents and our council to act hastily on decisions that impact our residents' lives. We talk all the time about local authority and how it gets stripped. It gets stripped when we make bad decisions. Um, our residents are never going to support us if we impact negatively their quality of life. And by diverting traffic from Maybank, which is a major road, through the middle of a neighborhood, we're basically what we're doing is we're putting a Band-Aid on the situation. We're taking it off a busier intersection, putting it in a neighborhood where we're actually, we could still, unfortunately, injure people. Uh, this is a very, very popular place to walk around and it's very accessible to the public. You have the golf course right there. We are doing our citizens a disservice, unfortunately, and I'm sick and tired of getting pushed around. But unfortunately, if we make bad decisions, now this area also is a very, uh, an, a very, um, a very county, uh, very high county area. There's very few city residents. But if I were them, I wouldn't want to annex into the city if these were the kind of decisions that our city council were going to make. So I think deferring it is kicking the can down the road. If we really want to send a message, we should vote no on this because this is the worst idea that we could possibly do at this intersection. I don't see how there's any way our council could ever support diverting traffic off of Maybank through the middle of a neighborhood. So I'm making a motion that we have a substitute motion that we vote this down and say no to this. A, a motion to defer has preference. No, no, so yes, it does. A motion yeah. has precedence. N not over a motion to defer. C can I speak Council to Member Jackson? Uh, all right. I do have to recognize uh, other councilmen who have not spoken yet. Council Member Brady. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd be happy to explain some thoughts, Council Member Griffin. 
Um, when we were reviewing everything yesterday, if you look at the traffic count numbers during peak hours, uh, there's about 30 people trying to make a left turn, and there's 1,200 during peak hours trying to get on the one, of whom I represent. 1,200 people trying to get through that intersection that get blocked by 30 people trying to make a left-hand turn. So when you just review it that way, those people on Johns Island already feel underrepresented on this council, and we're telling them that they don't matter because 30 people are going to dictate, and the residents, and I feel you and I hear you, but this has been an ongoing problem. We all know it has been. And the people I represent on Johns Island want to just be able to come home from work and not have to make unsafe traffic maneuvers to dart around people that are making a left-hand turn lane. This was the least bad option of all the bad options that we had. So I am going to vote to defer it. I want to see the left-hand turn signal. But to attack the reasoning and not give the benefit of the doubt to the colleagues who are on that committee I, I think is just a lack of decorum. Um, back to Council Just very, very briefly, I would ask that the Council, with all due respect, do vote for a deferral of this, because this is a deferral on the recommendation of what to do there, not of just this one recommendation. Right. And we want to make sure, with Senator Sen and everybody else, that it's looked at completely. And if one thing is clear from this conversation around here tonight, if a rec recommendation does come back to us to divert the traffic, you know what's going to happen to it. It's not going to happen. So I just don't think trying to direct it at this point, we're, all we're doing is deferring the recommendation. Any recommendation. Any recommendation. Any recommendation. Right. So I think it's the right motion and I'm going to vote in favor of it with the understanding, look, we, we, we did not have a great 24 hours. We get it, okay? Yeah. We're going to fix it before it goes and gets implemented. We're going to engage. Um, and I, I do want to just say this to the people in the neighborhood who came out and that you read about this in the newspaper, which I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> We learn about a lot of stuff sometimes in the newspaper too, it's okay. Um, not all of it is, by the way, perfect, and we're not either. So good for you for coming out tonight, good for you for sending the 3,000 emails. Please cut it out for a little bit um, until, <laughs> until we send you the next set of recommendations and we engage you, okay? So um, your leadership, by the way, your homeowner association president did a great job today. He got on it quickly, got on the phone, got on the emails, we talked to him. So. Uh, Although a little sloppy, this has worked, this process has worked. We haven't gone as far as we might have otherwise gone had we had this meeting today instead of yesterday. So I would ask that we mo move on this motion to defer um, and get it right. And we can, we can. All right. So uh, I do want to add for uh, council and our citizens' uh, ears that, um, you know, the uh, underlying motive of all this was about public safety. You all know there have been some terrible accidents there. And, and that's our ultimate goal, is try to keep people safe. I think it was clear um, with the different options that were presented that to do something with the light was the highest preference. But we, we were just presented with this information that of all the criteria that the DOT has about approving such a change, that we were dead in the water. So, so the engagement of our um, elected officials who represent us on the state level to give them the opportunity to go to bat and uh, see if they can advocate for that 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 option that I think would have provided more safety and, and keep keep the traffic flow on Maybank. Uh, we ought to give her that chance since she's stood up and raised her hand, hand saying that she could do that. So um, uh, we. we, we Hadn't resolved this, obviously, but um, uh, a little deferral here would give her that opportunity and our other state elected officials to, um, to try to come to a better outcome. So um, well, I do want to call the question, but if somebody hasn't been at recognized yet, Council Member Waring, very briefly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Listen, this is a tough one, but you know what? I think the system did work. Uh, we had a public meeting yesterday. Right. And believe it or not, I like to give compliments to the Post Courier because they had a good story in today's paper, which got the word out. Believe it or not, that's how I found out about it. I, I didn't, I'm not on that committee. And I, I would dare say a couple other council members found out as a result of the newspaper article as well, as these people, good people in the audience. And you know what? That's democracy. Right. Uh, some of the part about the additional information that the committee had, 
involved how difficult it is to work with the Department of Transportation. Now, they're all our friends, but they're difficult to work with. I think they would even admit that. Uh, that said, the system is now engaged. So today, I think you have 13 members of this council. As the mayor, obviously 12 council members, that if we were to vote on this today, that being the route, I think it'd be 13 to nothing. Okay? Um, so, democracy sometimes is like the birthing process. And I've been in that room with my wife. Okay? And I came out a different man on the other side. I really did. Okay? I really did. So, when Because of the engagement of the public at the meeting, at the newspaper, now responding, council members conversing with one another, praying that we do it in an environment that's respectful of one another, uh, we'll come up with a better solution for us. That's right. Absolutely. So all in favor to defer, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? You had one more item. <laughs> We're still in yeah. committee report, but very briefly, the last thing, sort of the dessert of it all, was we got a report from Mr. Benjamin, and I want to recognize him. He's been he's had a tough 24 hours, just like all of us, on all this. But he did present to us the plan for the resurfacing, restriping, and sort of reconfiguration of Brigade Street, which if you don't know where Brigade Street is, if you go, it's an east-west running street, um, north on Morrison Drive. It's it's an example of many things that we'll be able to do in the future, but as it gets repaved in the regular course of the repaving project, it is going to be restriped to make it a much more vibrant street, a much more user-friendly street, not just, just for those who are driving, but for those who are walking and biking. Um, also, as they do that, they will take into consideration water management along there, so it's not a, I don't, I forget, Keith, how many blocks this is, about a four block, five block area, but it's going to be repaved, restriped, we'll make sure the drainage all works, it's going to be much more accessible for those who live up there. It's going to be great for connectivity. It's going to end on the west side at the low line. When that gets activated, it'll give people access from the low line all the way to the east side of the peninsula. It's a really cool project, and we had a literally life-size version of it rolled out on the table. We actually had a meeting on Brigade Street, effectively, um, and if we can get a copy of that to everybody. So information only, this project is coming, and when do we think it's going to happen? end of the summer. So yeah. just keep an eye on Brigade Street. Uh, and with that, if there's no more questions, and I see there's one, I will conclude my committee report. And thank everybody tonight for coming out. Um, if you've never been in these chambers, it's a pretty cool place. Um, if you have been before, we we'll, won't we'll summon you back through the Post and Courier next time. We'll give you a little more advanced yeah. warning. So thank you. Council Member Jackson. Thank you. I, I just wanted to um, uh, confirm Council Member, our Chairman Seeking's uh, report about Br Brigade Street. and. This is, this is an opportunity and an illustration of when our relationship with DOT does work. Um, uh, Mr. Benjamin reported to us that this is the most dangerous intersection in, in the peninsula, if I understood that correctly. And we're taking advantage of the fact that the state DOT is resurfacing the street and they gave us the opportunity to make the improvements. So it's a good collaboration. It can give us hope. Um, I do feel like uh, in previous discussions, Senator Sun is going to be on the job. And I, that was my response to people as they wrote today, the few people I had a chance to write back to, that without our community speaking their mind to the leadership that's appropriate, and in this case it is the state, for all of these instances, we're not going anywhere. So we need to you know, be, the, be the jurisdiction that can give our voice to the state and take our responsibilities and not give them away. So I really appreciate it. The committee meeting yesterday was stimulating and we have a lot going on. All right. So community Thank you. development is great. T&T is great. Thank you very much. Uh, next is our committee on public works. Council Member Waring. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I tell you, it was a very short meeting if we accepted the noise audience. Other than that, everything went well. Um, the noise ordinance is still being worked on, but I need to share with you, I did call uh, building inspection, Mr. Mayor, and we were kind of operating under the premise that anything under $5,000, what I refer to weekend warriors or people working on their own home would be able to kind of, I think, have a pass on that. There's no such thing that exists with the city of Charleston, so there's no 
5,000 or 4,999 clearance that you can go and do without getting a permit. So not even 500. Not even 500. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, the example was given was $200. You still have to come down and get a $40 application fee. So that's something we can work on. You know, uh, before uh, we come back in two weeks, I think we'll get that worked. And we try to prevent, protect the private homeowner being able to work on his or her home during uh, the weekends and other hours also. That said, um, we did pass, uh, and I'll make a motion, the acceptance and dedication of rights away and easements, uh, AI and I2. Any objection? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, the ayes have it. And at the first part of the month, we always have a, uh, a detailed report from Mr. Fountain on the stormwater management. Uh, well, it was another thing I need to pass, and B, B1 or BI, where we voted to approve uh, the funding for um, AECOM. So I'll move approval. Okay. All right, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any ayes have it. Now we have Mr. Um, uh, we had some discussion on some points that I brought up, three points from the st stormwater uh, manual, which we will continue. We didn't get to finish that. We're going to send some of that in the, as a memo. You're right, Councilman uh, Griffin. But I want to get to Mr. Fountain's report on some of the things that's going on around the city and in your district as far as being updated. Stormwater projects being updated. So that, that is the memo moving around that we had discussed in the Public Works Utilities Committee. Thank you. This council member Waring mentioned we uh, we did discuss the AECOM uh, scope that was passed at Ways and Means tonight and then passed again a, a moment ago. Uh, that, that does provide for educational outreach workshops and related to the manual, which is um, specifically related to kind of major updates and changes in the manual to show the consulting community how to comply with those, um, those terms as one of the real thrusts of the manual is trying to simplify compliance. Uh, that was one of the major gives. It also provides eight technical memos to document and make um, into the record, here's how we would uh, expect you to demonstrate compliance. Uh, we did then discuss a number of questions um, that had been brought up by the, the committee at a previous meeting related to the stormwater manual and how it would impact uh, revitalization project work, infill development work, and then how the uh, process would be communicated and how the manual will be updated in the future. I did um, prepare a memo with a little bit more detail, but for revitalization it, it basically talks about something similar to what we had uh, seen previously in Church Creek. where. Uh, we're able to pass ordinances that are sort of customized to the particular problems that are causing flooding in different areas. Uh, that generally leads to a lot more citizen support and resident support when you see redevelopment occurring. They, it's something where you say this will actually make stormwater better rather than hopefully not flooding your property, which is sort of the general feeling that a lot of residents have at this point. Um, that generally is one of the hurdles for a lot of the revitalization projects is kind of resistance and frustration from um, local citizens. So in this stance, we're saying, well, that will help you basically demonstrate you are making stormwater better. You, in turn, will actually make stormwater better. That will open up more properties um, for redevelopment because we all know that if your property is regularly flooding, it tends to be an economic challenge to get someone to invest significant money in that property uh, because you're basically going to keep having these recurring losses. Uh, most of these areas in, in West Ashley, um, especially are in, in TIFFs where that redevelopment then leads to further revenue that goes back into the capital projects that the city is building to help reduce flooding in the, in the basin. So it's a nice cycle of as projects come in, they reduce flooding. As they produce more money, that helps the city build more capital projects, which helps further reduce flooding, and which helps you then revitalize more properties, which helps you create more money, which helps you reduce more flooding, and eventually you have a fully functional basin. That's the, that's the plan. Um, for infill development, I'm sorry, stepping one step back, one of the major things to realize for the revitalization is a little more complicated. Um, and I did try to explain it in the memo, and it's incredibly difficult to describe in a couple of sentences. But we did make a modification at the request of, of the Public Works Utilities Committee originally to modify our current city redevelopment ordinance for stormwater to say that right now we say if you have to spend 50% of your total property value, that's land value and improvement value, 
within a five-year period, you have to um, do one of three things to help basically improve stormwater on the property. It's not full compliance with the manual. It's not a complete redo of your site, but there are things to bring you more into compliance. Uh, currently, that has an exemption for interior, exterior, uh, remodeling work and um, pavement resurfacing work. So it has to be basically full-scale construction project at this point. We've torn down buildings and recreated buildings. Uh, the, the proposed manual updates would change that ordinance to eliminate those exemptions to say that that 50% value over that five-year period includes remodeling work, basically, interior and exterior. It doesn't include maintenance activities, you know, waxing the floors, general repainting, that kind of thing. It's but significant improvements that, that bring you up to that property value. So that, that is a change. Uh, we did also talk a little bit about... The fountain. Yes. If you don't mind, uh, let me tell you why that's important. In some of the areas that's being revitalized, West Ashley, James Allen, some of you all represent shopping centers that the flooding run through na runs through neighborhoods. Those older shopping centers basically were grandfathered, so they didn't have to hold the water on their site. That complicated provision that he just uh, gave you a cliff note version on is an attempt to bring them into compliance. So South Windermere, St. Andrew's Shopping Center, uh, Westwood Plaza, all those areas were revitalized but didn't hit the threshold in our previous ordinance that would bring them into compliance with retention ponds and the like on their parking lots, which would delay that water running through neighborhoods getting to the market. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's exactly right. They're, they're what we'd consider generally very low-hanging fruit projects and that most of those centers, if you did almost anything, you would improve the stormwater situation in those basins. Um, we also talked about infill development, um, specifically talking about uh, affordable housing and other, other small project work kind of in existing developed areas. Uh, we do have a provision in the manual for if you're under a half acre of disturbance, even in an area of known flooding, there's basically a menu of items provided that you can select from the menu to offset your new impervious area. The intent there was not to make small projects have to do massive drainage studies and bring in um, special design work. Instead, it says for every like 500 square feet of impervious area, you can add a certain amount of rain barrels or you can add a uh, rain garden, you can add infiltration trenches. It's supposed to say, you know, do, basically do something in your property and to raise awareness for understanding that you're in an area of flooding, that you're contributing to that um, through impervious area, but it's a relatively low economic impact. Once you're above a half acre, you do then come into the current requirements. Those requirements are specifically written to try to prevent development that will either cause flooding on that development or on adjacent property or, or area property. So there, there will be a different design shape for those properties once you're above the half acre. At that point, we feel you have enough land area to work with that you have options on how you do your design. Uh, finally, for process engagement, um, this is basically how we how we address the uh, manual moving forward. We are continuing the quarterly meetings of the stakeholder task force. Uh, we do have a resolution that says we'll bring the manual back for reconsideration by council by February of 2021 to, to see how the implementation is going and see if we need to make modifications. Um, we do have the work with AECOM that we just discussed. That's the four educational sessions uh, in addition to the eight technical memos. And then we also did, in, in addition to that, get uh, the developers of the LID manual um, in coordination with Ashley Cooper Cooperative Extension to come down and do a full day workshop, again, showing how to do that, how to um, show the design community how to implement those features, how to maintain those features. So that's also underway. And then as part of the Church Creek Basin work uh, with NIFWIF, which is the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant. We're working with um, Clemson Extension to do an outreach class of how do you maintain these green infrastructure systems as we install them on some of the bio properties throughout Church Creek. So that'll be another good way to kind of lead into that manual and create support for the local um, landscaping and maintenance communities to be able to learn how to perform that service. Uh, and we do have a public meeting that we're finalizing for next week in Johns Island uh, for Councilman Brady's request to try to make sure that the outlying areas have a chance to get into that. We're just waiting to hear back from the school on whether Tuesday or Thursday will be the ideal day, but we'll get make sure we get notice out to everyone. We've already talked with some of the groups and the stakeholders about that, that meeting coming. And we'll continue that, of course, with the, the four more educational sessions that will be. We'll try to do those around the city in different regions so people can kind of have a chance to come out and hear about the manual in more detail. Uh, getting into the, the actual project work, um, the east side drainage evaluation, 
So we've we've been going back and forth finalizing this scope with ACOM. I think we're we're just about we're in our last kind of our last revision. So we should see this. It'll go to capital project review uh, in two weeks, and it'll go to PACTA Council in the first March meeting, most likely. So that uh, will be basically the evaluation of all of the east side drainage inventory, doing the stormwater modeling to determine what the kind of where the current flooding is, with which we confirm then to calibrate the model with what we know is out there in, in flooding situation, developing improvement projects, and then doing some cost estimates on those. We've we've made this scope a little bit different than some of the work we've done in the past. We, we started this a little bit in DuPont Wapu, and we did this to some extent where we brought a lot of the community involved involvement into the into the work, not just sort of the engineers doing it in the back room. But we did put in a, after the evaluation process, we'll have sort of outreach to talk about possible project options, to have the community be able to come out and say what their priorities are for the projects. And then once we have sort of some finalized projects, do another outreach to say, here's where we see those projects moving forward with. Um, in addition to that, we have a heavy reliance on sort of um, what we would call like a multi-use type stormwater project where it isn't just benefiting flooding, it's also providing uh, secondary benefits, whether it's park space, whether it's recreation, whether it's um, walking trails, um, green space. So that is much in keeping with the Dutch dialogue. So we're saying make sure that's a focus of the uh, evaluation of project work. And that ties into our what we've previously talked about with the prioritization system, where we look at environmental impacts and social justice impacts and just in, in addition to just straight economic um, cost benefit impacts. Uh, the DuPont Wapu drainage improvement projects. These are the first four improvement projects. That scope um, we've negotiated with AECOM. We're now working with the county um, because the county has agreed to cover about 25% of that. So we're finalizing their comments, our comments, finalizing that with AECOM. We'll bring forth uh, an IGA or an MOU to finalize that fiscal arrangement and then bring that back to council for consideration for the design funding. Um, ongoing project work. The medical district tunnel extension, uh, we did approve that at uh, the final portion of the design work at a, a recent council meeting. Uh, we've met with the hospitals again. We're moving forward with easement acquisition. They're all very supportive of the project. Uh, we have that preliminary design work, so we're doing our easement corridor and finalizing our, our geotech. Um, the low battery, all the, uh, the first phase of demolition is complete. Um, all of the initial water line work is complete, so there's now a new CWS water service through the area, including um, services to the homes, which we're actually replacing current lead pipe service, so that was something that was pretty well received by the community to go from lead pipe to uh, modern, modern plumbing. Uh, we are getting significantly through production pile work. We did have some differing site conditions, um, which was not unexpected on a wall that's 110 years old. So we're probably going to have to modify. We are modifying the pile design slightly based on uh, the locations of the timber piles. That will be a change proposal that we're bringing back, but that's something we expected with this project. That's why we phased the original phase to do 1,000 feet to find out what we don't know as we basically remove this wall and start investigating the underground. Uh, the upside is that the other major unknown was um, subsurface void space, basically how much of the soil had been eroded out from underneath the wall over time, which you have to backfill with like a urethane soil amendment, which is very expensive. That seems to be much less than we had anticipated. So the two things will somewhat balance each other out as we move through the project. Um, spring fish burn phase three, we're in the, actually the last, the last set of concrete pours for the um, underground tunnel. It's the junction of the two major tunnels. So once that finishes this month, that will be the end of concrete work on the underground portion of Spring Fishburn. We'll still be working between the two bridges, but not on the underground section. Um, they'll be coming up to, sub up to surface and finalizing the sites, um, putting the covers back on, reopening the King Street uh, on ramp, some of that kind of work. Uh, King UG drainage improvement, we submitted our encroachment permits to DOT for review on the basically the street level improvements on that project. So that will be the first phase of that project. We do have our preliminary engineering report completed too for the pump station design for what the recommended options are for that, um, that approach, which we're going through right now with the consultant. And then we'll, we'll be bringing that next task to actually do the final design work on the second phase of the project. Uh, Church Creek and Lake Dodderer, again, we're finalizing that NIFWIF grant award for the conversion of the bio properties into beneficial use. It's, it's been awarded now, it's just finalizing the actual award documentation so we can bring it to council to formally accept the award and be able to begin work. Um, we've had a number of good negotiation and discussion um, sessions with local, kind of major property owners in the area in addition to that for potentially dedicating over um, large drainage storage pond, basically where we can um, renaturalize the existing canal into a stream, 
convert some of the, the large property areas into additional floodplain, bring back some wetlands to the area, and sort of do a regional uh, detention system, which we will kind of feed out of that um, buyout property work. Uh, we're also continuing to work with the county on the um, Glen McConnell widening, which is adding the basically additional drainage pipe under Glen McConnell um, from Lake Daughter to the south to help Lake Daughter also have a uh, uh, basically maintain a lower water level during these major storm events. For Barbary Woods, we did release the advertising for the request for qualifications on the Barbary Woods drainage improvement project, so that's now on the streets for um, consultants to respond to. We gave them about six, six more weeks for that, and we'll be having a committee to select the most qualified firm and bringing that back to council for consideration. Uh, William Ackerman is behind the Windermere Shopping Center. Uh, we've installed a check valve and a small berm installation. That's one of our small projects. Those are both complete. We should go from basically Ackerman flooding at just higher than a six foot tide to now it would take over an, about an eight foot tide before you have flooding. So if you get to that eight foot tide, you're going to get major flooding, but it won't be that constant recurring flooding now from, from month to month. Uh, let's see. Lord Calvert Drive, um, that project's in underway. Uh, we did have a different site condition on that one as well, where they basically, there's a corrugated metal pipe that the contractor, probably 50 years ago, had a uh, clay sewer conflict, and no one, you generally don't want to touch the clay sewer lines because they start to crack when you touch them and you have to keep chasing them, and they, it tends to become a very, very major capital project very quickly, so someone basically crushed the corrugated metal pipe to fit it under the sewer pipe. So since we're replacing with concrete, you don't have the option to do that with concrete pipes. So we're going to have to readjust that slightly, but that the project's moving well. It's just the excitement of um, exploring old sewer infrastructure. Uh, Danoon Drive is a, a project in Chatham Moss that's currently out for bid. So I'll be bringing that back to council with the, the bids and recommendation for award. Um, this isn't a directly a stormwater project, but it's one that we're heavily involved in coordinating that um, Councilman Waring will probably be interested in, that the county is beginning at sidewalk work on Orleans from Sam Rittenberg to Hazelwood. So that infill project is going in and we're coordinating from a stormwater perspective because, of course, that's also where we're looking at doing many of the DuPont Wapu stormwater improvements to make sure we don't create a conflict on two entities doing projects in the same area. Uh, and then for floodplain management, we're underway on appraisals for the HMGP buyouts from both Hurricanes Matthew and Irma, um, and we should we should receive grant paperwork to bring to council for the 2018 FMA properties shortly, which is another uh, two properties for purchase also as well. Uh, if we have a, a much more complete uh, presentation of all the actual project work going on, I think scheduled for February 19th. Uh, for, for council in a workshop session where we can get into kind of what are these projects and how do they work, especially for the new council members. But that's sort of the changes in the projects over the last couple of weeks. Thank you for your extensive report because the committee members get that uh, every two weeks, but everybody that's not on that committee, you don't get that, and certainly I can't give that kind of detail. So I, I know it's a little bit arduous at an open council meeting, but I think drainage is that important in every one of our districts. So. Thank you for what you do. I appreciate it. And it does sound like a lot, but it is this year we'll be expending somewhere between 50 and $60 million of drainage work on these construction projects. So it is a, it is a significant undertaking. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So next is our committee on special facilities. First meeting inside the mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yep, I think it's been about seven years since Special Facilities uh, Committee met. But, um, but you know, we talked about this today. Um, in fact, Councilman Shade said that our special facilities are real jewels. I mean, we've got special value, and some of our special facilities are some of the most special facilities in the country. And we need to make sure that we are keeping track of that, and we need to make sure that we're a good liaison to this council. So we will be meeting more often um, to, uh, to check on those things. Um, first item that came up on, on our agenda was um, the Alicia Pelosi plaque at the Dock Street Theater Courtyard. Um, Spoleto Festival USA was requesting to uh, requesting our approval to uh, procure and install a plaque in the Dock Street Theater Courtyard for Alicia Pelosi, for which that courtyard is already named. Um, Spoleto is seeking to complete that project prior to the start of the 2020 Spoleto Festival USA commencing, and uh, they would also be responsible for the cost associated with this. So, um, so they asked for our approval. Uh, the committee um, voted on this 
unanimously, so we take that um, to council. And for the rest of our report, I want to call on Mr. Fro update on our special facilities. Thank you, and I'll try to keep this really brief. It'll probably be much shorter than, than Matt's report. <laughs> um, but hopefully just as interesting. Uh, so the Angel Oak had approximately 400,000 visitors in 2019. Um, 40,000. No, 400. 400,000 visitors oh, in 2019. Okay. I thought you said 40 earlier today. No, um, 400,000. Okay. Uh, in 2019, um, they have a, we have a, a small, couple small projects going on there, but the big thing is there are some larger projects that need to probably be undertaken as far as enhancing the visitor experience uh, as well as protecting the tree. And there was some discussions about how we might go about possibly funding that. Um, ultimately though, what came out of that is what I've been tasked with is going back to the staff out there, trying to record. We just currently just click how many people come. We're not really keeping track of where they're coming from. So I have been tasked to go back and work with staff to try to gather some data over a period of a few months, maybe some slower periods, as well as high tourist season to see what percentage of tourists we actually have coming to the facility to see what our percentages look like and what some options might be um, for that to fund some things out there. So I'm going to work on that and report that back out to the committee. Uh, Dock Street Theater, um, the plaque was mentioned. Um, thank you for that. The Theater seats are going to be all reupholstered in 2020. So that was a project that was funded in 2019, but because of the calendar and all the events going on, we were not able to get it done. So there will be probably a two or two and a half week period where there will not be any events going on and we'll have all of everything um, reupholstered. And no, they will not be, council member, who was it that asked if they were going to get any larger? The seats will not be getting any larger, unfortunately, just reupholstered. Um, yes, certainly. Um, Old Exchange Building had 69,000 visitors in 2019. They are currently working on some facility repairs to both the cupola and the windows. Um, and they are also working to research and create some new displays. I, I know it seems like a relatively, uh, relatively low, low number. I think that's probably just paid visitors. I, I think that's probably not including some of the school tourist groups and things like that that are coming through. So I'm going to go back and probably verify that number with staff. I think that's a, an isolated number that they're giving. Um, the old Slave Mart had 83,000 visitors. That is actually uh, another record. I think it's about the fourth or fifth year in a row. It just continues to climb the number of visitors that come to see the old Slave Mart. Uh, they too are working on some new displays for the museum. and. Uh, out of the emergency action plan that we did with all the facilities, a couple recommendations that came out of from the police department was uh, a couple more security cameras as well as an AED machine. We are working on the security cameras right now. The AED machine has already been installed. Um, our safety management has already taken care of that. We've already trained some staff on use of that. Uh, the Maritime Center. The big thing with the Maritime Center is we kind of updated, we, you know, we did the MOU with the International African American Museum and the South Carolina Aquarium for use of the facility. Um, the aquarium is starting to discuss plans and designs and have engaged the city about our interest in working on that lease. Um, part of that includes the city trying to get out of our EDA grant requirements that exist. Um, legal is currently working on that. As that progresses, we will continue to bring that back um, to the committee. A few things that were, also were discussed had to do with the um, docks and Specifically, some things we're seeing happen with the docks. Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of transient boaters turn away from the docks after only being there for a day or two because of this construction going on with the IAM. Um, we're hoping the pile driving and sheet piling, which will be done in a few weeks, will kind of prevent that, stop that from happening. But that is something we are experiencing. We also have one commercial um, boat operator that has a long term agreement with the city that has asked if we would, they say that they're experiencing some impact their business as well, asked if we would consider freezing their rate 
in their agreement. Currently, the agreement goes up 3% each year. They asked if we would consider freezing it during the time that IM construction is going on. I've been asked to go back to them and ask for some data to kind of verify the experiences that they're actually having. I will, when I get that information, I'll bring it back to the committee. The last is the visitor center. Um, we entered into a management operation agreement with the CACVB for that facility, which included the renovation, which we funded over a two-year period. Um, last update I got is that the facility is scheduled to have a partial soft opening tied to some events with CWE this weekend, and they are on schedule for their June-July full opening as we speak. All right. Council. Um Member Sheely, any further report? No, sir, that's it for my report. Thank you. So uh, I would like to uh, accept a motion to accept the report since there was one action that was taken. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, the ayes have it. Um, so now we got two committees in a row going to Council Member Gregory. And before I, uh, I ask you to begin, I would like to share with Council that when I got elected a little over four years ago, that Council Member Gregory urged me to uh, greatly consider the use of our committee structure. Um, so, uh, how are we doing? How are we doing, Council Member Gregory? <laughs> <laughs> We're doing pretty good, aren't we? I, I, I think so, but I think okay. I, but I Many still, on recreation. <laughs> but, I, but I still think we're at the beginning stages of our involvement on our standing committees. I, mean, I think we're doing fine, Okay, but we still got a lot of work to do. Um, the Committee on Recreation met uh, today at 3 o'clock, and we only had one action item. However, there was a very extensive discussion on the, the low line, and I really can't wait until all of my fellow council members get a chance to see that presentation. Um, I do think that it's going to be an unbelievable um, addition to our city. Um, there was a request for uh, some funding, but we tabled that until we had further some time to sort of discuss where we'll get the money from, et cetera, et cetera. Um, B, uh, was just more of a reporting item. Um, C, uh, the naming and approval of signage for Brenda Scott Way at the corner of President and Fishburn Streets. Uh, just a little background, and this was recommended by um, Arthur Lawrence and the Burke High School class of 67, yay, 67. Um, and uh, the reason for the um, request is that um, on the corner of President and Fishburn, uh, Brenda Scott's father uh, operated sort of a soda fountain shop there. Um, that is, the, pardon me. I'm gonna tell you that later. Give, let me let me get you. Let me get you. Let me work it to it now. <laughs> Um, Scotty, uh, Mrs. Scotty was Brenda Scott's father. Uh, Brenda Scott was a 25-year city councilwoman on, on, on this council and served us very well. Uh, so our class thought it most appropriate uh, to give her her due, uh, as well as recognizing the importance of Scotty's uh, to most of the children and students and went to Burke High School. Uh, that was the only action item we had and we voted unanimously to support that. Second. Any, we'll approve that matter. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, the ayes have it. And Mayor, that concludes our report. Now I know that there's a whole lot of items down here that follow. And we are going to go through those item by item at our next Recreation Committee meeting and report the status of each to you following that meeting. Thank All right. You. So next will be our Committee on Ways and Means. We have a motion to approve. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed, the ayes have it. So uh, before they leave, I did want to note that one of the items on Ways and Means uh, commission uh, committee 
included our issuance of an additional bond of $7.9 million for the Charleston Neck redevelopment project area and uh, recognize Weldon Johnson who's with us this evening and uh, um, he works with the development there. And the reason I pointed out is that uh, a lot of this funding, uh, we, we as a city had the dubious distinction of having a uh, environmental super fund site and those are the worst of the worst uh, environmental sites in the nation. It was designated uh, many, many years ago. It was where the copper's creosote plant was in the neck area. And so a lot of the funding and agreement that we had with the developer, and you can see a lot of the work now going on, is, uh, is really cleaning up uh, that Superfund site and then the adjacent uh, fertilizer plants that were there as well. Uh, you might be old enough to remember the smell that you would um, smell when you were driving through the neck area of Charleston. So uh, we want to thank Weldon and, and his team for the environmental remediation that's going on. And my understanding is, is that when they complete the work, which is, is, is in earnest happening right now, that we'll be able to get the EPA to take us off of the Superfund list. Isn't that correct? Yeah, so, and also with him this evening, part of the team is Stuart Coleman, who in addition to assisting with this uh, matter for years, also served on our Stormwater Manual Task Force, so thank you for your service on that. So, uh, next we have uh, re bills up for second reading. We, we got one through ten that we can take together, all together. Second. Um, and uh, we got a second. And do we have any discussion or um, comments on any of those items, one through ten? Hearing none, all in favor, please aye. say aye. aye. Any opposed, the ayes have it. Now, I did note that on my agenda, number 22, there was a request to be withdrawn at the uh, request of the applicant. So can I entertain a motion to withdraw um, number 22? Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, the ayes have it. Don't now, y'all, uh, technically, uh, I'm supposed to sign these bills, uh, ordinances, before while we're still in session. Would anybody like to be recognized and make a comment while I'm busy at work up here? Third reading. Oh, oh, back to one through ten. Yeah, we need to um, have third reading and ratification. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, the ayes have it. That's it. Okay. I got a long name. It takes me a little bit of time here. You sure? Nobody's got an announcement of any kind. All right, there being no further business, I thank you very much. We stand adjourned. Thank you.